As you can see, rumors of the Mustang's demise were greatly exaggerated, and this is a 2015 Mustang GT. The Mustang has long been one of America's most affordable performance vehicles, and as such, the previous generation got a little bit of flack in international markets for still using a solid rear axle. This generation of the Mustang, however, is completely modern. Up front, 2015 combines the style of the Ford Mustang from the previous generation with a little bit of Aston Martin and a whole lot of the current generation of Ford with this particular opening design right here. Now, all models get HID headlamps as standard, which is an interesting twist. We get these striped daytime running lamps. Our model has the optional fog lights as well. Now, the front end is very similar model to model, but the GT does get these bars right here to help differentiate it a little bit. In addition, we have some attractive and functional hood vents. At just over 188 inches long, the Mustang is a hair shorter than the last generation. It's not really that big of a difference. This is a few inches shorter than the 2015 Chevy Camaro, but the 2016 Chevy Camaro will be right about this same size. You should know that as of today, the day that I'm shooting this video, Chevy has not released complete details on the 2016 Chevy, especially pricing or release date information. Therefore, we're going to be comparing this to the 2015 Camaro, the styling on the side of the Mustang is undisputably a Mustang, undisputably a coupe, but it has more style than previous generations. I really appreciate this line right here. The sheet metal actually curves up right here and then sort of back down into the vehicle and then up again to the hood. It actually gives it a very slight fin-like motif. Now, in case you're wondering, the Dodge Challenger is considerably longer than the Mustang. It's right around 10 inches longer or so. That is because we get a much bigger back seat, but also because it's based on a very large car. Because we are in the GT model, we have a big GT badge right here below the backup camera that is optional in the Mustang. And we have these sequential tail lamps, which were a Mustang hallmark and are back now. Very attractive LED lamps in these three vertical stripes. Now, if you put the hazard lights on, then these modules blink at once. We don't have that same stripey motion that we get when we have the turn signal activated. In case you're wondering, there is a trunk release button back here. It's positioned right down here under the GT logo, right above the license plate. Under this hood, there are three different engines for 2015, and 2016 brings a fourth engine. Things start out with a 3.7 liter V6 engine producing 300 horsepower and 280 pound-feet of torque. You then option up into a 2.3 liter turbocharged four-cylinder engine that produces 310 horsepower and a whopping 320 pound-feet of torque. It is faster than that 3.7 liter V6. The GT model uses this 5 liter V8 engine producing 435 horsepower and 400 pound feet of torque, and this thing redlines way up there in the RPM band. The GT350, which is coming for 2016, replaces this with a 5.2 liter V8 producing 526 horsepower and 429 pound feet of torque. The first three engines are mated to either a six speed manual or a six speed automatic, and we're told that the GT350 will be manual transmission only. Fuel economy does range all over the place depending on the engine and the transmission that you get. If you get that 3.7 liter V6 engine, you'll end up in the 21 to 22 mile per gallon combined range. The six speed manual and the 2.3 liter turbo is the most efficient at 26 combined. The Mustang is interesting because it's one of the few vehicles left where you can actually choose different axle ratios based on your preference or the package that you select. For the uninitiated, you should know that the axle ratio has a direct impact on performance times, 0 to 60, quarter mile, etc., but also fuel economy. Front seat comfort really depends on which version of the Mustang you get and which seats you get. It's the lowest actually in these optional Recaro seats for me. These do not have any power adjustment at all and no adjustable lumbar support. I find they really lack lumbar support and I find they are a little bit too narrow right here at the middle point on the back. Obviously, if you're a slimmer person than I am, you'll find them a little bit more comfortable. And if you're a larger person than I am, they'll probably be a little bit less comfortable. I'm gonna give these seats six out of 10 points when it comes to the front comfort score. It jumps to eight out of 10 if you get the base model of the Mustang in those regular seats. And then it goes up to nine out of 10 points if you get the top end seat, which is heated as well as ventilated. I do find the current generation's Camaro seat to be a little bit more comfortable than the top end seat in the Ford Mustang, but these are definitely more comfortable than what you'll find in the Dodge Challenger. Now the Challenger has some very wide seats, but the seat bottom cushion especially is definitely firm. I didn't find it quite as comfortable as the standard seat in the premium and above trims. As you'd expect with any two door coupe, getting into the rear, it is a little bit tight back here. Now the front seat is adjusted for me at six feet tall. Legroom is not too much of a problem, even though this Mustang is slightly smaller than the old one. Instead, like basically every two-door coupe out there, 
headroom really is the problem. My head is touching the rear window and I can't really sit very upright in this rear seat. I could do this if I had to, but it's not terribly comfortable. Now, if you're after a big back seat, the Dodge Challenger really is the only thing out there for you. And that Challenger is the only vehicle in this segment that also has a middle seat in the back, making it a five seater and the Mustang and Camaro are four seaters only. On the practical side, the rear seats, the Mustang do fold and the cargo pass through is really quite large for a modern vehicle. It extends almost to the side of the vehicle and it is quite tall as well. Makes it very easy to pull luggage like this right here into the passenger compartment. Taking a closer look at the interior, you can see that we do not have adjustable headrests. Again, because we do have the Recaro sport seats, you can see that Recaro is right there on the seat itself. Although these seats are leather and perforated, they are neither heated nor cooled, and you can see how aggressive the bolstering is on the seat back and seat bottom cushion. The front doors are a combination of hard and soft touch plastics. We have stitched pleather in this insert, a soft touch armrest, soft touch upper portion of the door, and then this portion down here is all a hard touch plastic. We do have a decently sized storage bin right there with a bottle holder below that handle. Ford went for a symmetrical style on the dashboard, but this part is actually not a direct mirror image of what we find on the driver's side. We do have Mustang right down here, labeled since 1964. And then below that, we do have a relatively large glove compartment right there. I was able to stick a tablet computer inside, and this is sort of a faux brushed metal trim. Moving across the dashboard, we have a speaker grill right up here, two air vents that do rotate around and completely close, oil pressure gauge, and a vacuum gauge in our GT model. Below that, we have the MyFord Touch infotainment system. Now, we do expect this to be replaced by Sync 3 at some point, perhaps in the 2016 calendar year, but we'll know more about that later. If you want to see a complete review on MyFord Touch, go ahead and click that banner on the bottom of your screen. You'll be taken on over to that review. We have some fixed buttons right over here for the system. Track forward, backward, a sound button right there, eject button for the single slot optical disc player. Below that, we have our dual zone climate control. These are toggles right here, up and down for temperature, auto button right over there. All Mustang models now get a keyless go system, so that's why we have the start stop button right here below the climate controls, hazard lights, trash control disable, selection for the steering mode, and this allows us to change the steering feel between comfort, normal, and sport, and then a drive mode selector that allows us to choose between normal, sport plus, track, and snow and wet modes. Below that, we have a single USB input right over here. We'll shake our logo for our optional audio system, 12 volt power outlet right over there. Now we do have a second USB input in the center console. Because we're in the six-speed manual version, we do, of course, have a manual shifter right here. Reverse is all the way to the left and up instead of all the way to the right and then down, which is my preference. I have heard a few complaints about the shifter in the Mustang, and I will say that this shifter does seem to be a little bit rough around the edges. It's not quite as smooth in terms of engagement as some of the German transmissions out there, but the shifts are relatively short. It's easy to tell that you're in the gear, so engagement is very, very positive, and the clutch pedal feel is absolutely excellent. The area all around that shifter is a hard touch plastic, and it is easy to bang your elbow on right there. We have a traditional handbrake right over here and two very large cup holders. On the driver's side, we have a four needle instrument cluster and the speedometer actually says ground speed, which is kind of a cute little touch right there. Inside that, we have a multifunction display that is basically the same size in most models. That display is controlled via this button arrangement right here on the right side of the steering wheel. In addition to giving you your typical trip computer information that we're seeing right here in a fuel economy graph, we also have some additional gauges which are very handy in the model we're taking a look at right here. We have an air fuel ratio gauge, you can actually switch between this text layout and a gauge layout, cylinder head temperature right there which is kind of unique, inlet air temperature, oil temperature, voltage, etc. All these you can click to the right and then get a gauge readout for those particular gauges. We also have track apps, which of course gives us an accelerometer, acceleration time, brake performance, and the ability to line lock the brake system. That's so you can do burnouts. This is also where you would access the launch control system built into the car. You can adjust its RPM. And of course, it tells you right over here on the right side that you're supposed to be doing this on the track only. Of course, even though the system says that you're supposed to be using launch control track only, you'll notice that we do have a little launch control icon right down there, and it will basically stay engaged whenever you need it. Zooming out to the buttons on the steering wheel, that is that button module right there yet again. On the right side of the steering wheel, a volume up, down, track, forward, backward, and a mode selection button. We have a mute button down here, voice command button, dedicated phone hang up and pickup buttons. And in a unique twist, we actually have radar adaptive cruise control in the model that we're in right here, even though this is the six speed manual equipped version. This is one of the few vehicles available with that combination of radar cruise control with collision warning and a manual transmission. The steering wheel is a three spoke tilt telescopic steering column with this round airbag cover and the Mustang logo right there. The three spoke design is overall very comfortable. However, I would prefer some more aggressive sport grips, at least on the bottom right down here. 
Zero to 60 obviously depends greatly on which engine you get. It also depends on which transmission you get and what rear axle ratio you get because there is a wide variety of different ways to configure your Mustang. The model we're taking a look at right here is the Performance Pack GT and we ran from 0 to 60 in 4.5 seconds which is really, really quick for this category. It's actually kind of difficult to get a rear wheel drive car to 60 faster. It's really obvious when you take a look at the 0 to 30 time which is about 2 seconds. A lot of cars that are much more powerful than this have difficulties getting the 30 under two seconds. It's all about the traction and all about the grip. That's also why we get a limited slip differential in the rear end that does help apply that traction. We also have wider tires in the back than you'll find in a number of vehicles out there. The new suspension design in the Mustang also seriously helps improve performance because we get a lot less axle hop in the back than we got in the previous generation model. Now that said, the previous generation Mustang GT was incredibly well designed for a vehicle that had a solid rear axle. The solid rear axle in that car really only got upset when you were accelerating around a corner with rough pavement or broken pavement on it. In most day-to-day -day situations, it really wasn't a problem. Keeping in mind yet again, we are in the GT with the performance pack, 60 to zero braking times were absolutely excellent. This came in at 108 feet, which is very, very short. A complaint about the previous generation Mustang was that the car felt a little bit under braked sometimes, and I don't think that's going on in this Mustang, thanks to the weight reduction as well as the brake upgrade. Now the base version of the Mustang can still feel a little bit under braked at times, but I don't really think that's a problem because it is a relatively inexpensive car. When it comes to handling, I'm gonna give this an A, but I am going to say that the BMW M235i handles better than this and it feels better than this. The handling ability of the Mustang is incredibly high, but the feel is where this car cuts us short just a little bit. We of course have electric power steering. That's something that every new car is getting basically. We do have different ways of commanding that I can click this little button here and adjust the steering feel, but none of those modes are really going to give me much more feedback from the front tires. All it's really going to do is make the steering a little bit heavier or a little bit lighter. With 54% of the weight up front, the Mustang GT can feel a little bit front heavy at times. I don't really think that's too much of a problem because it is a fairly typical feeling for American pony cars, same sort of feeling you get in the Dodge Challenger or in the Chevy Camaro. Now, something like a BMW M235i is going to feel a little bit better balanced, but then again, so is the Mustang with the EcoBoost 2.3 liter engine because that comes in right around 52, 48%. When it comes to the ride score, it's important to keep in mind that ride and handling are often two ends of the same teeter-totter, especially if we don't have an adaptive suspension system and we don't have one in the Mustang GT. The rumor mill tells us that the GT350, however, will get one to help improve the ride when it's in its softest mode. The GT with the performance pack as we're testing it right here is just a hair too firm for my tastes. It actually is made a little bit more pronounced by these Recaro seats. I think that if I had the standard seats in this car, it would be a little bit easier to bear on my daily commute, but I actually prefer the EcoBoost with the performance pack or the GT in its regular suspension design. Something along the lines of the Dodge Challenger will give you the most compliant highway ride, but it's not gonna handle as well as this model. This 5-liter V8 engine has an absolutely incredible sound to it. An interesting twist for this generation of the Mustang GT is that launch control basically always stays on. So once I've enabled it in this little menu thing right there, I can actually use it at any time. So it's different than a lot of cars out there where you have to turn on launch control every single time you want it. For this model, if you really feel like stoplight racing, even though you're not supposed to, and I shouldn't be recommending that on this channel, it will help you in that situation. That makes this a little bit easier to live with in daily driving. Part of the reason I like an automatic transmission is that that zero to 60 time is very predictable because it's not really dependent on you slipping the clutch perfectly in first gear every time. Of course, with launch control, this will do it perfectly for you every time. 2015 certainly brings a quieter cabin in the GT. Of course, if we want to hear more of that engine, all you have to do is rev it up and we still get an awful lot of engine sound into this cabin. This engine revs up to 7,000 RPM, which is an absolutely insane number. But of course, the new GT350 will rev even higher thanks to a brand new engine design. Fuel economy can be tricky to talk about in a performance car. I've been ranging from 18 to 19 miles per gallon in mixed driving. Obviously, the more fun you have with your Mustang, the lower your fuel economy will be. In terms of transmission feel, this manual transmission is definitely a team player. Engagement is very, very positive, has a very notchy feel to it. Now, some people may dislike that. It does not feel quite as refined as the manual transmission we find in some German cars out there, but it does have a nice short throw to it, and the clutch pedal is absolutely perfect. Engagement is very easy to define, 
pedal effort is not terribly high. And something that I appreciate in this particular model is that the clutch pedal and the brake pedal are right about the same level with one another. It makes it a lot easier to find an ideal driving position. Out on this road, the last generation of the Mustang just felt unsettled. It was all due to that solid rear axle. The solid rear axle also meant it sometimes had difficulties applying all that power to the pavement depending on the pavement surface. This generation of the Mustang, however, feels entirely different. It feels much more nimble out on the road. We get a suspension that doesn't get upset over these rough pavement areas in the corners right here. And overall, it's just an awful lot more connected to the driver. Now on the downside, the steering in the Mustang is just as isolated as most vehicles on the market right now because we do get electric power steering. Now we can adjust the steering effort in the Mustang, but we cannot adjust the steering feel. So we're never gonna get more feedback from those front tires. A wise man once told me you should never confuse steering heaviness or steering weight for steering feel. It's definitely going on in this Mustang. Pricing for 2015 is very reasonable. The V6 engine starts at $23,800. The 2.3 liter EcoBoost engine bumps that up to $25,300. And you can get into the GT for $33,300. Now the important thing to know about the Mustang is that the convertible versions don't have the same trim levels as the coupe versions that we're taking a look at right here. So the pricing doesn't quite align up. The V6 convertible will start at $29,300, the EcoBoost at $34,800, and the GT at $41,800. But when you compare the feature content you get in the convertible version of the Mustang, the true difference ends up being somewhere around $2,000 or so. In general, I would recommend against getting the nearly $1,600 Recaro seat option. You lose the power adjustability, the heated and cooled seat functionality, as well as a decent amount of comfort in order to get these Recaro seats. Now, they are better bolstered on the sides, so if you really plan on tracking your car, then you may want to do that. But for a daily driver, I think there's too much of a compromise for those seats. The automatic transmission is $1,195. Obviously, that would make this a better daily driver, but I like the six-speed manual, and I like the fact that it's available in all models of the Mustang, and I think that would be my preference. $1,195 gets you the radar adaptive cruise control and the collision warning package on the GT or the EcoBoost model. In kind of a unique twist on the market right now, you don't have to get the automatic transmission in order to get the radar cruise control. Obviously, it's not a full speed range system, but this does very well for itself out on the highway at speeds above about 30 miles an hour or so, just leaving it in sixth gear, using the radar cruise control for slow and go traffic. As I would equip the Mustang, it ends up at $36,600. That would be essentially a fully loaded manual transmission EcoBoost model. Compared to the current generation Camaro, I would take the Mustang easily over the Camaro. There's something just a little bit odd about the Camaro's handling, especially out on broken pavement. I actually think that the previous generation Ford Mustang was a better handling and better feeling vehicle out on my favorite winding roads than the current generation Camaro, even though that previous generation Mustang had a solid axle and the Camaro had an independent rear suspension. Now the 2016 Camaro is essentially going to be a Camaro-ified version of the Cadillac ATS Coupe, and that really does have some very good potential over there for Chevy. Like the Mustang, there will be a four-cylinder turbocharged engine in the Camaro for 2016. However, it's gonna be the base engine, not the up-level engine, and it's actually less powerful as well. It's 275 horsepower. The V6 would be my choice over there in the Camaro by the spec sheet. It's about 335 horsepower for that V6. The important thing to know about the 2016 Camaro is that not all the details are out and pricing, most importantly, has not been released yet. We do expect it, however, to be about $25,000 starting, so it should be about $1,500 to $2,000 more expensive than the Mustang. You should know that the Camaro will also be using General Motors' brand new eight-speed automatic transmission, and that does have some serious benefits when it comes to acceleration in the automatic transmission model. I would expect the V8 and the V6 models to be faster zero to 60, than the Mustang we're taking a look at right here. Dodge's Challenger is an interesting option. Starting just under $27,000, the Challenger has one V6 and three different V8 engines to choose from, but it's a very different vehicle than this. It's bigger, it's considerably heavier as well. The Challenger is also a five seat coupe, so it means it's a little bit more practical and it has a real usable back seat. The trouble with comparing the Ford and the Dodge is that they're just not the same kind of vehicle. You can think of the Dodge as sort of a parallel to the BMW 6 Series Coupe, and this is a parallel to sort of the BMW 4 Series Coupe in terms of overall size. Now the Challenger ends up being relatively good value, especially if you want a big V8 engine and a manual transmission. The Scat Pack version, especially with that 6.4 liter V8 engine and a manual transmission, is a hoot and a half out on the road, 
but it won't handle nearly as well as the Ford Mustang. It definitely feels big, it feels heavy out on the road. Now the SRT versions do tighten things up an awful lot, but it's still going to feel quite large. Of course, you can get that absolutely insane 707 horsepower V8 engine. That's an awful lot of fun, but you probably will handle better in any version of the Mustang. We then have a few competitors that I would say are a little bit less direct with the Mustang. That would be the Hyundai Genesis and the Nissan 370Z. Now the big reason that those are not quite as direct is because they're V6 only. The Genesis has actually lost its two liter turbocharged engine this year, and the Nissan has never had one. That means that in 2015, there are two flavors of the Mustang that have no direct competition from either of those two brands. And for 2016, there will be another model that doesn't have any direct competition. The Genesis and the 370Z put down some decent power, but both of them are also more expensive than the base V6 version of the Mustang. When you actually start adding feature content, things don't necessarily get better, the Mustang will still be a better value. In the past, you could explain away some of that difference by the nicer interiors that we got and the independent suspension that we got in the Nissan and in the Hyundai. However, that's different for this model year because we have an all new and all fresh Mustang. It looks fresher on the inside and on the outside. We no longer have an interior or an exterior that looks a little bit behind the competition. And in fact, it's now Nissan and Hyundai that look a little bit dated compared to this vehicle. Depending on how you configure your Hyundai or your Nissan, they can be a little bit faster than the V6 version of the Mustang, but remember, that is the base engine over here, and that's the only engine on that other side. For the starting price of the Nissan 370Z, you can buy a very nicely configured EcoBoost Mustang that will give you better fuel economy, very similar performance. And you're only a few thousand dollars away from the Mustang GT, which will give you superior performance. Perhaps an unlikely competitor, we have the BMW 2 Series. I've recently reviewed the BMW M235i, and I would say it reminds me an awful lot of the Mustang. Performance is not that far off the M235i versus the Mustang, but they are different kinds of vehicles. The Mustang is a more classically styled American two-door coupe. It's big and it's imposing on the outside. The BMW 2 Series looks a little bit plain, a little bit restrained perhaps, and it's also significantly shorter than the Mustang, even though the interior dimensions and the trunk dimensions are relatively the same. A lot of that comes right up here with this enormous hood that we get on the Mustang, because this was designed with large V8 engines in mind. In the past, European comparisons with the Mustang have always led to people saying, well, you know, the American car feels heavy and the European car feels light. Well, that's still true to a limited extent with the BMW. However, the actual curb weight is only about 200 pounds off. That's due as much to the BMW getting heavier as the Mustang getting lighter. Now, the biggest real difference between the two is the weight distribution. It's nearly perfect 50-50 in the BMW, and it is a little bit front heavy in the Mustang. But of course, we do have a large V8 under this hood. Now, the Mustang GT is faster than the M235i that we tested. However, you can get certain versions of that BMW that will beat this particular Mustang. If you get the BMW with the 8-speed automatic transmission and all-wheel drive, then it will be a hair faster 0-60 to than the Mustang we're testing right here. The BMW is reasonably priced, starting right around $43,000, but if you add all the options up, including the 8-speed automatic and the all-wheel drive system required to be faster than the Mustang, you'll end up right around $50,000. That means that the Mustang is still a better value, even though it will require a slightly larger parking stall. Actual handling numbers are not that different between the M235i and the Mustang GT. Keep in mind, we're not talking about the M2, which will be out shortly. It probably will handle and accelerate faster than any version of the Mustang available in 2015, but we haven't seen that model yet. The primary difference is the feel. The BMW feels a little bit more direct, a little bit more connected to the driver, now both have electric power steering and that does cause some lack of feeling in the steering column for both vehicles. We still get a little bit more feel in that BMW. Is it worth the price difference? That's something you have to decide. Thanks for taking the time to check out this video. Again, I'm Alex Dykes and this has been the 2015 Mustang GT. Go ahead and check out the BMW M235i video down there at the bottom of the screen. I'll also try and get my hands on the EcoBoost model if I can. Go ahead and find me over at Facebook, over at Twitter. Like this video. Likes are very important to Alex Nato, so be sure and click that like button down there. Subscribe if you haven't already done so, and I'll see you next week.